historic tax credits have made the preservation of older buildings not only a matter of respect for beauty and history, but also for economic good sense. But that being said, Donald Trump and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and House Speaker Ryan all agree that tax reform is a principal priority of this new Congress. Speaker Ryan's framework for tax reform eliminates many tax expenditures, including the historic tax credit. And I don't have to tell you that if that happens, that will be an incredibly serious loss for the preservation community. So there are a lot of issues for us to consider uh, today, and these you know, expand beyond the ones that I've listed to include community block grants, climate, uh, climate change impacts, and others. But I would like to add just one more that may not involve policy per se, but that I think is a paramount issue for our country. If there's one truth that we can all agree on right now, I think it's that we exist in a very divided time for our country. Uh, at a time of you know, increasing division between red states and blue states, the vision of one America united by a common history and joined in common, in common density towards a, uh, seems as contested as it has ever been over the past century. So it seems to me that there's an especially important role for us to play as preservationists, and we have to find a way to, to span that breach. Because we all know how historic places can promote understanding and bring people together, and even those who disagree on other things can agree on working together to save places that matter to them in their, in their communities. So we have a lot to talk about and a very short time to do it, and I'm going to sit down now and invite our panel to come forward and, and cede the podium to our moderator, David Dudley. Thank you, though, all for being here this afternoon, and I look forward to joining you in what I believe will be a very robust conversation. David? I'm actually going to sit down, uh, so stand by. so much better. These are amazing um, microphones. So um, Stephanie, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, this is a topic and uh, um, a, uh, a question that has uh, really consumed pretty much every waking hour since about mid-November for uh, us at um, City Lab. City Lab is a, a publication that's published by uh, The Atlantic. And um, I've been there uh, not even a year uh, and uh, well, found myself uh, waking up one morning uh, in November uh, with my colleagues kind of looking at each other going, what do we do now? Uh, the publication had existed, uh, you know, for about five, six years and it had always uh, operated in a, a universe where there seemed to be sort of a prevailing narrative that the, the, the federal government was uh, a force that valued urban life and was imperfectly but um, consistently uh, trying uh, to uh, uh, improve life for people who lived in cities. And uh, in, the, in the wake of the election, one of the, the many sort of uh, storylines that, that we were told so much about was this notion of uh, uh, a, a, a renewed uh, urban-rural divide and this sort of uh, the, uh, the, the roots of rural resentment and the, 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 the clear sense that um, cities were, were targeted uh, and were going to be uh, a battleground for this administration to, uh, to uh, um, focus its attention on. So we've, um, we've, we've been covering this, this story of what, um, what uh, the, the future holds for American cities since November, and it's been a challenge uh, on any number of levels. The, uh, the narrative changes a lot. Uh, things uh, seem to get ever more surreal uh, when you uh, are, are dealing with the, our, our news cycle. Um, but in a way, it has is, it is sharpened our focus in the sense that we are very interested in the parts of uh, governance and in the parts of civic life that function. And increasingly, we see that happening in cities. And 
and cities really are places where, where lawmakers do have to get a certain uh, baseline uh, number of things done. And uh, it is a, uh, a, a arena where, where problems need to be addressed and problems need to be solved. And uh, for that reason alone, it's, it's been a, a really uh, interesting ride. And um, when it comes to this question of, of why is America so divided, why are we so broken, um, it is often, uh, in, in my experience, the, the, the places that are functioning the best are often uh, the, uh, the, the, the places that are, are, have the richest historical fabric, uh, that are uh, places that were built uh, on a human scale uh, at a time uh, when that was done, and where, where people have uh, lived and dealt with their uh, fellow neighbors for decades and hundreds of years. And, and historic preservation offers us a way to, to uh, look at uh, America's problem-solving abilities. And, and that's really sort of what, what uh, we've been working with a lot uh, at City Lab. And what we're gonna talk about today is sort of what uh, the emerging reality is uh, under this administration for, uh, for uh, not just uh, uh, urban places, but all places uh, uh, that matter in the United States that have uh, have historic value and and uh, and need support and and how they're going to get it. So I want to start off uh, by introducing our first panelist, uh, Jennifer Vay, uh, has been at the Brookings Institution for a long time. Uh, Brookings has been a, a great sort of a, um, source of, of research and and insight into urban America and, and urban communities and uh, what makes them work and, and their prospects for the future. Uh, Jennifer's done a lot of work uh, on uh, older industrial cities, uh, places like Baltimore, which is where she lives and where I live, uh, and where, in fact, uh, she's my neighbor. Uh, and, in fact, our kids are going to the same school. Uh, and. Uh, and they're good friends, so uh, it's good to see you, as always. Uh, I'll see you at the drop-off lane tomorrow morning. Um, but uh, uh, curiously, I, I ran into uh, Jennifer's work about a decade ago when I was the editor of a magazine in Baltimore called Urbanite, uh, which dealt a lot with, with preservation and sort of this question of how to sort of economically revive a, a Rust Belt industrial place. Uh, and uh, she's, her work has really just been uh, enormously useful in, in sort of teasing apart the various economic forces that are uh, uh, at work in cities that are struggling. And um, I want her to talk a little bit about sort of this broader context of, of what's, what, what is the, re the reality that, that urban America is looking at uh, under this administration and um, what are the sort of the headwinds that, that they are likely to be facing. Okay, thanks so much, David. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. I guess I need to get my mic on here. Um, thanks to all of you for being here and thanks to all of you that are, that are watching um, on the internet. Um, so, you know, the big news, of course, is that this past Tuesday, President Trump released a $4.1 trillion budget plan to Congress and unless you've been living under a very large rock the last couple of days, you're probably pretty well aware that this budget cause, calls for inc some increases, mostly around defense spending, but really sharp decreases in funding for a lot of other discretionary programs. Um, so look, there's a lot of different charts out there, some really nifty breakdowns that provide all the, the fine details of the plan and how it really stacks up against federal spending over time. So I'm not going to go into those excruciating details, but I'll just you know highlight a few things and then try to put them in a little bit of a, a broader context. Um, you know, first of all, if you look at some of the things, um, some of the programs or agencies that are are facing severe cuts that really influence the the kind of um, issues that we all care about. One um, HUD is clearly one place to look. Um, the budget calls for a decrease of about 13 percent um, from last year and a the president's budget also puts a fair number of pretty significant programs for urban areas on the chopping block. So that's everything from things like Choice Neighborhoods, um, the Community Development Block Grant Program, um, which has been in place for quite some time and upon which a lot of um, cities particularly rely to fund all sorts of different um, programs, uh, particularly those that, that deal with blight and, and low-income populations. 
Um, the Home Investment Partnership Program focuses on affordable housing. Um, other, you know, rental assistance to tenants, all, all looking to see either total elimination or deep, deep decreases, which clearly, if, if this would happen, would have pretty significant ramifications for a lot of our, our urban areas. Uh, at the same time, um, as was noted, you know, there's still the potential for a ma some major infrastructure investment. Um, the, you know, the president continues to reiterate his campaign promise of a trillion dollars over 10 years for infrastructure. And actually, attached to the budget, there was like a fact sheet that, that gives you some of the details of what he's proposing, which basically amounts to that the federal government would contribute about 200 billion in the hope that then that would further incentivize um, other partnerships with states and cities and certainly the private sector. Um, Senate Democrats came back with a counter analysis showing that, well, yeah, but in fact, this current budget actually puts a lot of cuts um, on the table, particularly in transportation and other types of infra infrastructure spending that could really counteract that. Um, and, you know, so, you know, in addition to you've got HUD, you've got what's happening with infrastructure, which is a little bit up in the air, um, potential cuts, though, though we don't fully know what's going to happen. Um, and then a lot of other cuts across a lot of other agencies and a lot of programs within them, everything from, of course, Interior um, to EPA, you know, um, Health and Human Services, you name it, pretty much, unless it's Veterans um, Administration, Department of Defense, or Homeland Security, there's a lot of cuts involved. So, look, you know, there's, there's been a lot of writing, a lot of analysis out there, everybody's speculating, um, but... But at the end of the day, the question is, so what, is, what does this all mean for the places that we care about? So, you know, first of all, when it comes to the actual budget, we actually don't have any idea. <laughs> um, it's pretty clear where the president's and the administration's priorities lie. Um, but, you know, obviously, like, like any year, this needs to go through a very messy congressional, you know, budget process. And we certainly know that most Democrats are going to fight vigorously against a lot of the cuts, but in fact, a lot of Republicans aren't necessarily on board with all of them either. And, you know, every year, this is, this is certainly the case. I think it probably, you know, we can expect a lot more messiness than, than we've seen in the past. Um, but there'll be a lot of eyes on the process and a lot of analysis out there that I'm sure that we will all see over the next, over the next four months. But for now, you know, it's, it's a lot of wait and see to see how it, how it all comes out at the end of the day. I think, you know, aside from that, in terms of what this means, and, and more importantly, is this is really another indication that localities really need to be masters of their own destinies. And this is something that, you know, we, we and my um, work at Brookings um, and my colleagues have been out there sort of beating this drum for a while. Um, coming at it first, a lot from the standpoint, there was just a lot of gridlock um, over the last X number of years. Now we're in a situation where we're also facing a lot of cuts and just simply a lot of unpredictability. So, you know, what this really means is it's leaving localities, both big and small, largely on their own, um, to design, to finance, to deliver multi-sector initiatives on economic development, on infrastructure, on housing, on building quality places, um, which certainly includes preservation, on education, on, you know, building our talent pipeline. You know, a lot of these things, which at one point were seen in large part as, as the responsibility, at least from a funding perspective, of higher levels of government. Um, the federal government, um, on one hand, but also state governments, which frankly um, have, have sort of been out to lunch themselves. Um, and I don't know that we're going to see a lot of changes there. So it really comes back to the point that, that cities and towns, um, large and small, you know, really just need to st continue to step up and really unlock the, the latent capacity of their public, private, and civic networks and, and really start to get creative to foster new ways um, of dealing with their physical infrastructure, of growing their talent pipeline, of focusing on economic development is initiatives. And the fact of the matter is, you know, we, we are seeing a lot of this innovation happening throughout the country. I mean, if, if you can go to, you know, any place from the biggest cities to the smallest towns, and you're seeing a lot of this 
this action happening and a lot of places getting quite creative in terms of you know, how, they're folk, how they're going to finance a lot of the things that they, they know need to get done in, in order to build quality places and to serve their populations. So, I mean, you can look at, you know, even in this last election cycle, um, places as diverse as, you know, Columbus, Ohio, LA, Seattle, approved about $180 billion in additional taxes to spur um, transit projects. Other cities have been, you know, doing the same, taxing themselves to do things like fund um, child development or educational programs. So there's a lot of this innovation happening, and the bottom line is we, you know, we know that this is going to be um, what localities need to continue to do the, for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think it's important here that when we talk about localities, we're not just talking about local governments. Because the fact is that cities and counties aren't, aren't just governments. It's not just about the public sector, but they're really networks of the public sector, of businesses, um, of civic leaders, of the philanthropic community, of universities, of all different types of community institutions and other nonprofits that need to collaborate together to solve a lot of their local problems. And this means it needs to be across disciplines, it needs to be across jurisdictions, um, you know, cities working with their suburbs, working with their outlying rural areas, it needs to be across sectors, it really needs to be a networked approach because there's really no, no other alternative um, for localities as they, as they really need to grapple to, to, to seize on their own opportunities and solve, solve a lot of their own um, problems. I think the third point is that this really matters for communities of all sizes. Uh, certainly, I focus predominantly on, on urban areas, um, but, but what we know is that place matters more than ever, whether you're a small place, a big place, or, or something in between. And I think what we've been seeing in, you know, in a lot of our work is that these sort of decades-old um, prognostications about how the internet you know, would make locations obsolete. Um, I think I think we're all pretty clear that that has yet that is yet to come true. As David was saying earlier, um, place place basically matters more more than it ever has in many ways, and quality places, and that's true. You know, in in rural and mid-sized towns as well as our largest cities, all of whom are, are really competing to do the same thing, which is you know attract business, grow their own businesses, um, grow talent, and and attract workers, um, and. Basically, what this means is that when cities, you know, think about, well, you know, how do they go about doing this? Um, they all have the ability to to leverage the density of older and historic buildings, of their educational institutions, whether they're major research universities or you know small small local colleges, of cultural facilities that um, you know are located again, whether it's big museums in in your large cities or other types of you know smaller arts institutions that are in smaller towns. And even old main streets and downtown areas, and all cities have really the capacity to be making these kind of investments, and that's precisely what we're seeing places do, and precisely what they need to to, to continue doing the in the future. And it's not to say that that this is easy. Um, local leaders, business owners, residents, first of all, have to identify their major assets. I think sometimes in the bigger places that might be a little bit more clear, um, but it's certainly true in your even your small towns. We've sort of you know, as David was referencing, gotten into this situation where we've, we've you know, had this a bit of a pity of, of the rural versus the urban. But the fact of the matter is, all these places have assets, um, many of which are just, you know, really haven't, haven't yet been fully tapped. Um, all places need to understand what their identity is, particularly in terms of their economies. You know, what do they do well? What are their competitive advantages? How do they relate maybe to bigger places um, of which they are a part. You know, many, many rural communities in this country are actually part of large metropolitan areas. And there's really an integral relationship between those small communities and the bigger cities um, that are, that, uh, you know, where they're sort of in their, in that orbit. Um, and so they, you know, they really, all places really need to understand what that, that identity is. Um, they need to be, you know, nurturing production, new innovations. They need to be activating their public spaces. Um, which is so important to placemaking and to building quality places. They need to be enlivening main streets and also really focusing on their downtowns um, and investing in them. And some of this, you know, it sounds like fairly obvious, obvious kind of stuff, but I think we've seen a lot of this neglected over time, um, particularly in a lot of our cores and our towns and our cities. That's changing. Um, I think anybody who's been, you know, recognizes that we've got the wind is at the back of 
of our communities in many ways. Um, we certainly see it in our larger cities, you know, with demographic trends and even a lot of market trends that are really turning the tide back where people are really care about cities and are valuing a lot of the assets the cities have. Um, small places have a lot of those assets too, and it's a matter of really building those networks to be able to tie into those assets. And sort of circling back to the beginning here, um, now is the time more than ever because the, the funding isn't necessarily going to be there, so it's really going to be up to community leaders of all types to be getting awfully creative and innovative about how they're investing in their own places, um, tapping into their assets, and creating um, the kind of communities that work for everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the, this notion that you have to be uh, wherever you are, the master of your own destiny, uh, and, and this, this is a kind of beating the, the drum of localism, which we have been uh, banging on a lot in the last few months, uh, it is uh, a great in theory, the idea that, that power can finally now devolve down to the state and the local level, and the places uh, uh, that are um, passionate about getting uh, a new transit system or uh, building a park are going to have to figure out ways to, to basically pay for it themselves. Uh, I want to pivot over to Marion Werkheiser, who is the founding partner of Cultural Heritage Partners and an expert on this intersection of the law and preservation. And I want you to tell us how we can do that. <laughs> um, uh, what are the, the sort of, let's, if we can kind of get into some of the nitty gritty, um, what are the, the ways that uh, individual uh, local places can um, either resist or tap into the prevailing uh, uh, political headwinds. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I think I'm going to flip the script on you a little bit um, because federal policy impacts historic preservation in so many different ways. What the federal government does really does matter for all of our communities. And in particular, a lot of my work focuses on how do we um, strengthen and advance the National Historic Preservation Program, um, the permitting review process that requires federal agencies to take into account the effects of their projects on historic properties throughout the country, um, and budget processes throughout the federal government that we rely on to protect a lot of the places that we care about, um, and many of them are in jeopardy at the moment. Um, there's some narratives that are going around Washington that I think create a lot of headwinds for us. We're hearing that regulation is bad for business, that we need to talk about streamlining regulatory review, um, that regulation is very costly, and then if we could just peel that back, we would have this wonderful economic revival. Um, we're hearing that state and local authorities are better positioned in some cases to manage federal assets. So we're hearing a lot of talk about states taking over management of public lands and that states would have much better input on preservation decisions. But if you get rid of the federal regulations, a lot of states don't have robust historic preservation laws. So we could lose a lot of tools that we have in our toolkit now to protect those places. Um, we're also hearing some pushback that um, research funding and support for historic preservation and for the people who study the past and um, help us learn from our past, that their work isn't delivering the public value that the taxpayer should expect. Um, so we, I think we need to figure out ways as a community to counter that narrative. Um, and we know how to do that. We know how to, de to balance development and preservation. We've been doing it for 50 years. We have wonderful examples that show that you can have your development and preservation goals and that they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, they can very much complement each other, um, especially in the, the examples you cite in the urban context. I think that we need to talk about ways um, that our current National Historic Preservation Program is already a federal, state, and local partnership. Um, we, may, we have federal agencies who participate in the program. We have state historic preservation offices. We have tribal historic preservation offices. We have local communities who are using historic preservation laws to protect the places that matter to them. So rather than getting lumped into all federal regulations are bad, no, we have these regulations for a reason, and they allow input at all levels of government, and they allow for local communities to have a say 
Um, but without that mechanism, a lot of places will come up short when it comes time to, to stand up for places that they care about. I think that there are, there are five quick areas I want to touch on that I know that um, folks I work with are following today um, a little bit more specifically. The first is this regulatory and agency reform issue. Um, we're seeing that this is one area where Congress and the White House seem to have a lot of agreement. <laughs> they may not be able to come to terms on things like healthcare or infrastructure yet, but they very much seem to agree that we need some sort of regulatory reform. And that's really designed to rein in the agencies and rein in the executive branch. So we've already seen the House pass bills that would change the way that agencies can conduct rulemakings that could have a lot of impact on our programs. We've seen executive orders that would require for every new regulation that agencies identify two regulations that could be rescinded. We're seeing directions from Office of Management and Budget for agencies to drastically reduce their staff and to do a comprehensive review of all of their programs to see if they're delivering the kind of public value that we need. So it's a very, a very much a shift in the way of thinking about the executive branch. And as preservationists, we need those rules. We need people in those positions in the agencies to conduct these reviews. We need funding to make the system work. And so I have a lot of concerns about what the impact of that regulatory reform and agency reform effort could have on the day-to-day -day business of preservation. Um, the, uh, the second area is public lands. And um, Stephanie touched on national monuments in her introduction, which of course is an area that all of us are very concerned about. Um, there's also been, I think that the national monuments issue really illustrates a couple of these tensions. Um, people who don't feel comfortable with our current national monuments, many of them are saying that local communities were not afforded an, the right opportunity to have a say in those designations. And so some of them are framing it as executive overreach. Uh, others are saying that, you know, designating a national monument can limit the uses of that land and that we need to have more development. So there's also that development and preservation tension. But I think that, that we can show that it's important for our economic development long term to have these places um, protected and to have these cultural sites um, listed as national monuments. But understanding that, that both of those narrative headwinds are coming together in the national monument discussion I think is important. Um, on public lands, we, we're hearing um, that a lot of people think states could be better managers of some of those public lands, and I think that that's another area where we can expect to see some movement. Um, at the same time, we're seeing some opportunities. The um, Secretary Zinke has talked about how the, uh, the National Park Service maintenance backlog is a real priority for his tenure, so we may actually be able to see some some progress on those kinds of issues that we've been concerned about for a long time. The budget, of course, everybody's talking about that. Um, we're looking at, at budget in several different ways. Of course, there are very critical grant programs that support historic preservation throughout the country. We're taking a close look at the Historic Preservation Fund budget that not only funds um, SHPOs and TIPOs, but also right now has competitive grants funded. And in fact, for the first time in many years, we got Save America's Treasures grants back during the spending deal uh, just last month. So we've actually gotten a pretty good deal for the first few months, but looking to next fiscal year, we're concerned about all of those competitive grant programs being stripped out of the budget. And we want to make sure that our state and local partners have enough money to be able to hire the people to process the reviews and to maintain our preservation infrastructure throughout the country. Um, there's also a lot of concern about the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation and other sources of research funding for people who study uh, historic places, the archaeologists, the anthropologists, and others who rely on federal funding, which is frequently matched many times over to do their work, and so we've already seen a lot of attacks in the president's budget on those funding sources, and that really could ripple throughout our community if, if those funds are taken away. A um, couple more things real quickly. Infrastructure, 
We've yet to see a deal come together. I think it could be a huge opportunity for the preservation community. Um, as long as our historic preservation uh, permitting review process remains intact and that we have that section 106 reviews are required for these infrastructure projects I think that could be a real boon to our community because it gives us um, a mechanism for surveying additional parts of the country for historic uh, resources and um, and a way of advancing a lot of our goals I think it also opens a window to advance some of the things that we have known need to happen for a long time. Um, there's a lot of talk about how we should be able to streamline the regulatory process and make it less costly and remove delays. And I think a lot of us know of very common sense approaches that could have that impact, but we've not been able to have that conversation in detail with legislators. So for example, we know that um, SHPOs could use extra funds to finish digitizing all of their cultural resource records. And the ability to get access to those more quickly could certainly um, accelerate and expedite cultural resource reviews. So things like that, we may actually see a, an opportunity that we didn't have before uh, to have those conversations and, and get those things done. Um, finally, tax reform, um, Stephanie mentioned this, this is a, gr a great concern to all of us because we know what an amazing program the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program is. And so defending that, making sure that it survives and thrives in whatever tax reform package is passed is certainly a very high priority um, for preservation advocates around the country. So those are, that's a real quick survey of the landscape of things that we're taking a look at. I'd love to hear if there are, are issues that you're following um, as well and, and take your questions in a bit. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to invite folks who are uh, monitoring us online to also, uh, at this point, uh, throw in questions for uh, either of our panelists um, and uh, obviously folks in the room. Uh, the magic red button on your microphone will make you a part of the conversation. Um, but I had one question uh, regarding this infrastructure bill. This is something we've been following rather intently at, at City Lab. It, it has a lot of, um, uh, there's a certain amount of excitement about, you know, America's going to build again and what are we going to build and how are we going to pay for it? Uh, the actual budget numbers are, are, are indicate um, the government is not super interested in actually paying <laughs> for a lot of this infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, talk about basically uh, structuring a series of incentives so that private developers can mm -hmm. be a part of that. Uh, e historically, that has, you know, most infrastructure doesn't make a lot of money. Uh, toll roads do. So you're going to, uh, you know, prepare for some exciting new toll roads in your life. But are there, are there uh, other usages that anyone uh, is familiar with where there are uh, opportunities to lure private developers into a historical preservation themed project that, that you're familiar with. I mean, the historic, the historic tax credit program is a great example of leveraging private dollars to do historic projects. So in that sense, it's a real, um, a real winner that shows that, that some federal incentives can have an outsized economic impact. Um, but as certainly as the infrastructure bill comes together, one of the things that I'm watching is where, where is that money coming from? Because we get um, historic preservation taken into account when there's federal dollars or federal permits needed or federal land. And so if we're not actually using federal dollars, uh, I want to make sure that we are able to still require that infrastructure developers take a look at what effects they're going to have on historic resources. There is a qu question from the field um, about the infrastructure, since we're talking about that. Um, and the question is, has the preservation community come up with a plan, sort of how would we spend the infrastructure mon money in an ideal way if we had it? So we get ahead of it, ahead of the game, by knowing how we would use it. Uh, this is Tom Cassidy, and certainly at the National Trust, we prepared a series of documents for the incoming administration that we have shared with people in the departments and on the Hill. Um, there's still a lot of people from the administration who have yet to show up in town yet, 
um, but there were three parts of our infrastructure proposal. The first would be um, utilizing or focusing infrastructure investments on the $12 billion backlog of the National Park Service. Uh, Secretary of the Interior Zinke has stated he believes that's an appropriate use of infrastructure funding. Uh, we have also recommended, as Marion was describing, that there be a significant infusion of investment so that uh, state and tribal historic preservation officers could help design projects to avoid historic resources through the digitization of records and thereby having a faster, more efficient project by actually having the data up front. And then finally, as we were reviewing then-candidate Trump's um, speeches, he talked a lot about the need to invest in the, what he described as the disaster areas of our urban and rural areas, and we took that as a clue to recommend increasing the historic tax credit um, by 30 percent for at least a short-term period, as has been done in the wake of other disasters, notably Katrina. So those are some of the ideas that, that we're trying to bring to the table. And I would note that there, we do know that the historic tax credit is the most significant federal investment in preservation. It has catalyzed well more than $120 billion of private investment since President Reagan signed into law. So there are things that do work. Any other questions from the room? Um, I had a question uh, regarding this notion that, that uh, and uh, you mentioned this, Marian, that, that th this, the, the, the idea that, that individual cities have or localities can um, uh, be creative and come up with enough money to, or, or regulatory, you know, uh, inf uh, 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 background in order to get stuff done. That's not, not something that is available to a lot of communities. Uh, uh, you know, California can put all its money together and, and build a high-speed train, uh, or say what other you know buildings in in, in New York or Boston. Um, how can you know smaller, less resourced communities sort of tap into the tools that are out there and and you know make stuff happen? Is is, is it is there education involved? Is there uh, are there are there creative ways that Places that don't have a lot of resources can, can try to uh, maintain uh, a certain amount of momentum. Um, I would point to the Main Street program. Um, you know, the National Trust has been working with communities throughout America, um, certainly a lot of smaller communities through the Main Street program, trying to build the expertise and the capacity of those communities. Um, to protect the historic downtowns that they have and leverage those for the greatest economic benefit. So I think that um, we have some of those tools now, um, recognizing from Jennifer's comments that we're going to need to step up even more. I think that's certainly an area where, as a community, we should think about how do we grow those investments and in building the capacity of these communities to take advantage of all of the, the lessons that we've learned over the years around the country and bring them to their own communities. And I think too is you know it does partly come back to recognizing the assets you have and squeezing more juice mm -hmm. out of them. Um, you know, even in a lot of smaller communities, they may have a small college or a community college um, that's already you know educating, particularly on the community college level, you know, their citizenry. Well, how well are some of these you know how well are, are the curriculums of those colleges always aligned well? with either the existing economy or the economy that they're trying to build? How can you start to forge new partnerships? And you see this in bigger areas as well, certainly, between the private sector activity that exists and the type of training um, that's, that's future, that's looking forward, um, and making sure the students are, are well prepared for those sorts of jobs. And often what you see is, you know, there are assets that are there that may be under, just under-realized. Uh, the other place there's, you know, there's assets is in many communities, the, the public sector owns a, a lot. Um, and figuring out new ways to, to you know, tap in <laughs> to that wealth that's, whether it's in, you know, existing buildings that are underutilized or parking or vacant properties, you know, things that communities actually have on their own books that could be, um, you know, getting, getting a little bit more creative about how you, 
capture some of the wealth that's there and be using it for other purposes. Any questions from the internet? The, there is another question from the um, online audience, and I think this is shifting a little away from the conversation we've started here, but we've talked about tax credits and policy and planning um, and, all, and regulation, but is there something more that the preservation community can be doing? And I think it, it actually goes a little bit to what Stephanie said in her opening remarks about this sort of divide and where historic places play. And so this person wanted to know um, if, there, if we need wholly new approaches, alliances, partnerships that are sort of outside those traditional um, things that we've built already. And so getting a little bit beyond the policy um, discussion and more to a greater conversation if you have thoughts about that. I would love to know if there are like examples of, of that you could cite uh, anyone actually in the room of that kind of kind of creative uh, partnership network building uh, uh, communities that are using buildings in, in, in non-traditional ways and, and tapping into non-traditional communities in order to do that. I think that we need to be much more coordinated and collaborative and find our champions where they are. Um, it's been really uh, certainly satisfying for me to see how, for example, the outdoors community has stepped up when it comes to the Antiquities Act and the National Monument Reviews. Uh, we have an amazing ally in them that I think some of us didn't appreciate before. So how can we figure out the ways that our issues are impacting other communities and, and then bring them into the conversation or, um, or work with them directly to augment what they're already doing. I think we've got a lot of friends, we just, we haven't, we haven't said hi to all of them yet. <laughs> and I think that these creative partnerships are happening every day. There's one that occurred to me, which is in the city of Birmingham, where the city owned a uh, underutilized asset, a place called the A.G. Gaston Motel, which was an, the epicenter of the, um, civil rights struggle in Birmingham in the 60s. It was abandoned. There were discussions about tearing it down. Uh, partners in the trust developed an alternative vision of a preserved and rehabilitated A.G. Gaston Motel. Um, it ultimately led to a phenomenal partnership with the city of Birmingham, uh, with Congresswoman Terry Sewell, and ultimately with President Barack Obama, who declared this area to be the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. And this place that was an abandoned, municipally owned structure um, will now be the centerpiece of a phenomenal story that will tell the story of the um, civil rights in, in America. Any other questions from the room? Um, the, this notion of, of how do we value history and uh, what we're going to value uh, in this in this coming administration? Uh, how do you can you speculate on how that might play out? Uh, what this is an administration and a, a president whose understanding and grasp of history has been a, a topic of some discussion lately. Uh, is is that going to make uh, the job of the preservation community harder, uh, or are there opportunities to uh, to be exploited? Is this a segue into my wrap-up? Yes, it is. Is it time for your wrap-up? Oh, it is. Uh, brilliant. I have <laughs> timed it perfectly. Um, but, uh, uh, well, I, I, I would uh, kind of ask it to the room, too, because we have uh, preservation professionals around. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, certainly it's a question that, that, as we cover preservation topics at, at, at City Lab, um, and uh, we're always sort of desperately interested in places that are coming up with, with creative solutions uh, and getting around uh, sort of uh, intractable seeming problems. And uh, often those, those solutions uh, revolve around a, a creative reuse or a creative way of, of rejiggering a neighborhood around uh, a, some, some public facility or some public land. And, um, you know, as much as we talk about, well, we're gonna have to be creative, uh, I also see a lot of, of threat. Uh, I see uh, 
the possibility that a lot of the inequities that we have um, we've seen build up over the last 10, 20 years uh, could be intensified, uh, and and we could see cities that have the means, uh, you know, able to to kind of maintain their their preservation uh, um, scene, and the places that don't have the means uh, falling further behind. So I, I'm just interested in in, in opportunities and and sort of um, you know give us the good news give us give us the tools that we need you know to, to whether it's to take action or to kind of redefine advocacy uh, in order to sort of uh, prosper in a, a, a different environment plainly we're in an incredibly fractured political environment. And it is very easy, um, and I'm here to testify, it's easy to get discouraged. Um, I mean, my job is to convince people like Stephanie that I should be employed to affect the government of the United States, and it is a challenge. Um, but I think that in this uncertain times, there is always the opportunity to raise our voices. And that is what, optimistically, democracy is all about. And I'm not a Pollyannish type of person. I'm prone to profound cynicism and skepticism. Um, but things change. And it is our responsibility to find these examples and to make them successful. We talk about innovation. Well, there are 34 states that have state historic tax credits and as we have looked to modernize the historic tax credit, credit largely to, to better benefit Main Street small deal communities, we've incorporated change, uh, innovations that 17 states have done, which is to permit a tax certificate to make these investments much easier for the smaller investor in our small urban towns. Um, earlier this week, uh, we delivered to uh, Capitol Hill three different national sign-on letters uh, from battlefield advocates and state and local preservation groups and Main Street communities. And we delivered um, 320 groups from 45 states calling upon the Congress to enact legislation that's been introduced on a bipartisan basis in both chambers to provide a dedicated funding source for the maintenance of our national parks. Um, it's going to be a hard thing to pull off, but it is a great example of new voices coming to the protection of historic resources within our national parks. Um, you know, you know, we've. And Tom, yeah, if I could just say please. there, I think, you know, for me, one of the um, silver linings, and I've had to look really hard for some of them yeah. <laughs> in the new environment. <laughs> has been the outpouring of interest from people in engaging more in advocacy. I think that um, you know, some of us have grown complacent over the years, and the fact that we are having these conversations is galvanizing people throughout the country to take, you know, take action, to call their senators, to, to sign on to these types of, of public letters that they might not have felt comfortable doing before. And so I think the more that we can encourage that behavior um, and help people feel confident in engaging in advocacy, the better. And, and I've certainly seen that among the groups that I work with who have come together since the election in a new coalition called the Coalition for American Heritage, where we are trying to leverage both grassroots advocates and organizations at the national level to have a coordinated voice on these issues because we recognize that we're much stronger in numbers. And, and that's been really gratifying and I think we can build on that and hopefully we'll have those sorts of mechanisms even in the better times to come and <laughs> to sustain us in the long term. And, and I think this point about grassroots is really important because it has to be coming from both yeah. sides. And in our work, we really focus, we, we have a partnership with a group out of New York called Project for Public Spaces um, through this um, BASS initiative on innovation and placemaking, of which I am the co-director. And so our work really focuses on this nexus between particularly the innovation economy and place. And as we move forward with our work, you know, what, what we really want to focus on is, is this issue of place and how we reorient our thinking around specific places, not just 
individual cities or towns, but places within them. You know, right now, whether it's at the federal level, through the state, all the way down to the local level, in most issue areas, they tend to be very much in their own lanes. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could turn that on its head and start to talk about communities as places and think about, because we all know, you know, the relationships between health and housing and place and preservation mm -hmm. um, and education and the way that they all align, but yet our funding streams don't work that way. Um, so how if we start to take a much more place-based approach, does it also up, open up more opportunities for advocacy and just for stronger democracy? It's, it's, a, it's an ability to bring a lot more people in these communities into the process and to really engage in their own place in a way that, that we haven't really seen in many places. And I think that's gotten us to a lot of the, um, the issues and tensions that we have. Uh, one last question from the from the field, and it's a sort of a practical question. You know, what is the timeline here? How long would it take for changes that are being proposed to really go into effect? And I, I assume you're going to say there's urgency to it, but I think the person wants to realistically understand how much um, the rules could be changed and how quickly rules or policies. And then that would be the last one. Well, we certainly saw. Um the Congress uh, rescind a whole suite of long thought out rulemaking earlier this year. So that happened rather quickly. Um, in terms of the budget, um, I think that the proposal by the President, it's broadly, um, most commentators do not expect that Congress can actually write a bill that would pass at the funding levels proposed by the President. So that will drag on for quite some time, probably have a continuing resolution. The President tweeted a few weeks ago that what the country needs is a good government shutdown in, October, in September. Um, you know, who knows? Tax reform is very unclear. We saw that the Congress and the administration are fractured over health care, and those same fractures, I think, exist with, with taxes, but they could make it happen fast. And that's just the truth of the matter, uh, using, I won't bore you with what budget reconciliation means, but if they ever got a budget resolution, they could do significant change to the tax code with 51 votes in the Senate, and that's fast. We are, uh, we are out of time, but we are, we are blessed in that we are living in a fascinating period of American history. And um, I want to, uh, I'm sorry. And if I just might yes. introduce Susan West Montgomery, who has a video for us. Susan Indeed. is our <laughs> Vice President for Preservation Resources at the National Trust, and her team has brought us all together here this afternoon. Indeed. I was going to do that. Oh. <laughs> just. No, I mean, I think um, it's a very, raise your voice. There are opportunities and people listen. The reason why healthcare was a political problem is that people have gone and said, we don't like this. And that will be the case in smaller manners in many of the policy debates that we are, are confronted with. Um, so yes, I would say, Go to Capitol Hill, it's a fun place. If you don't know, if you don't know people who can take you around, we know people who can. Um, meet with your legislators back in the district. You can take them and show them a historic place. Legislators are thirsty, and their staffs are thirsty, to find them cool things to do when they're back home besides just raising money. Uh, they want to go see places in their district with people like you who live in their districts. Be an American, it's fun. <laughs> thank you, and I do wanna thank all of you who participated both online and here in the room. This is the first time that we've tried this type of a format, our forum town hall. We'll be interested to know what you think about it, um, whether we should be doing it again. Um, and the way to stay and continue this conversation and to be ready to act as opportunities present themselves to act is to really stay in touch through forum. Um, many of you already are um, involved directly, but we also have a new platform called Forum Connect, and this is an online community
community where we can have these, continue this conversation. So I hope that you will go to forum.savingplaces.org and be part of that continuing conversation. Um, we'll have a reception following, but I did want to share both with our folks in the room and online a little preview um, or a little inspiration for our Past Forward Conference in Chicago. Um, here's a, a short clip that'll get you sort of excited about what Past Forward is all about, and we hope to see you in Chicago. The beauty of preservation is that one small change can set off a ripple that helps to revitalize an entire neighborhood or city. And one person's actions can improve the lives of countless American families. And so I'm here really to argue, to advocate uh, for an engagement with creating a more complete American identity, a more complete identity when it comes to telling the stories that have made this nation. Because the reality is what you do is so much more than historic preservation. What you are doing through historic preservation is you are telling the story of a community. You're defining who we are as a nation. You're talking about our struggles and our journey. You're helping us understand who we are so we can pass that on to the next generation. You and I, we do the same thing. We're in the story biz. And so much depends upon us. And that's why I love that tagline, past forward. By understanding and reconciling the past, we can find a beautiful road forward. But we have to be honest and truthful about it.